everybody, and welcome to World Class Radio. I am your host, Ricky Canals, and thank you so much for tuning in to our very first show. I am extremely excited because this has been in the making for almost two years now, and it's all coming together. So with World Class Radio, World Class started off as a publication idea to appreciate the ageless time of football. But I also wanted to discuss with coaches, players, and influencers that help bring recognition to the football world. So we decided to make a magazine out of it, but also start a radio show to give our followers a different perspective and not only read, but listen to their favorite player, coach, and influencer on how to overcome hurdles and figure out how they made soccer a part of their everyday life. After that, we would like to share some music with our listeners from upcoming music artists and hopefully make this a platform for them. Finally, for the last segment of the show, we will interview someone who has made an impact in their football community and listen to what they have to say. So I won't be discussing any news in the football world just because I wanted to introduce the show, but I promise I will be sharing my opinion on the next show. But we have a special show for you today because we will be talking to a former Carolina Real Hawks player and current coach for Jacksonville FC and a good friend of mine, Remick Safi. He will be discussing his upbringing and learning what it takes to keep his love for football in everyday lifestyle. So stay tuned. We have that on the way, but here is some new music for you from Enrich off his new album, The Day I Lost It. Here is Banana Fragrance. You are listening to World Class Radio. Feeling this too long, I've been feeling this two ways. Yeah. We've been chilling out loud, 
to my feelings on the low Ain't got no vibes in my eyes, please, they're written on stone Oh yeah, that kick back strong, please don't take too long You feel so devilish, but you weapon since I'm making back home Yo, we been chillin' on the low, kept my feelings on the low Ain't got no vibes in my eyes, please, they're written on stone Oh yeah, that kick back strong, put my face in the snow Got me going to the moon, shit, going to leave soon That was Banana Fergans by Jacksonville's local artist and Rich. I hope you enjoyed that tune right there and mark it down to your playlist. Thank you so much for tuning in to World Class Radio. And once again, I am your host, Ricky Canales. Now I'm joined here with a special guest, someone that I've known almost a year now, right? It's found about maybe the first time we met was the Interjax tryout. And well, we didn't meet at the Interjax trials. We just, I just saw you there and I just took the photos of you. You, you came over, start taking pictures, and I was looking around. I'm like, who is this guy? I wonder if Marius said to find him. Or I was wondering if uh, one of the, maybe Vanya, uh, he got you involved. And then I asked you, and you were like, no, I just found out the, about the tryout, and I just came to take pictures. Is that how, that was the case, right? I remember someone put out a flyer, and I, I was just like, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to wing this, because I knew Armada... All that stuff, they had their own situation, but I wanted to, you know, be involved with something new. Yeah. So I never heard of this. So I was like, let me go see what this is all about. When I got there, a bunch of kids, everybody, I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> so after that, I just took photos. And I think I was just so nervous, just so shy because I'm very mm-hmm. antisocial. So when I saw this, I was like, you know what? Let me just take the photos. Let me see if my work can just do all the talking for me. And I'll just at least tag them i won't dm yeah. them i won't send a message to them or email i'm just gonna tag them on instagram and see what happens and who was the first person to I, see I, I i reached out to you i was like hey you know i, I we just met at the tri- tryout great pictures and i remember messaging you telling you like if you want to you can come to and help us to take pictures of the team so and that's how we you got involved with the jacks and i was on my way to work thinking should i quit my job now <laughs> and just work here full time but there's no money involved <laughs> so yeah. for for those that are listening right now explain who you are and what do you do so my name is Ramek Safi i i have a nickname i go by Remy but i'll answer to any of those names Remy Safi Ramak coach coach yeah and um i'm just a uh, coach uh, I, I was born in Iran moved to the States when I was 17 years old moved to Jacksonville I've been here for 20 years I'm 37 now and uh, yeah I just I'm a soccer lover and I love playing it and I'm a coach I love coaching it as well you I co- still play but you know you coach for JFC except Jacksonville just yeah. JFC yeah I uh, coach for JFC been part of the club for 10 years you know, I used to coach the academy just when you coach them on Fridays and little kids come and you teach them soccer and you have fun. Then I start coaching travel, had my U7 teams, uh, U8 teams, seven-year-olds. Mm-hmm. Now they're turning 17, same guys, so 10, nine years ago. Okay. And I start coaching travel, different age. Yeah, and every year I've coached ever since. Even when I was playing for Armada, I think that's the only year I didn't coach because I was playing for Armada. Mm-hmm. And I had a full-time job. I was a fitness, uh, I was a manager at a fitness center. But yeah, I've been coaching and getting licenses. As we speak, I am in the B license course. And this morning I had, I had a meeting before I came out here. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. I had a meeting. Like we have a group project. I met with my group for 30, 45 minutes, we talked about our group project for the our license. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I got you. license, yeah. Got you. You said you moved to Florida when you were 17? Correct. How old were you when you moved to the States? Uh, same. So, I landed at JFK February 27th, 27, 28, 2001. Oh, okay. And then 
two, in two days later, or maybe 36 hours later, we flew to Jacksonville. Oh. And I've been in Jacksonville ever since. Oh, okay. Because I, I, would watch, I was watching your documentary made by Jack. By the way, shout out to Jack. Great documentary. Jack Trent. Uh, yeah. Jack Trent, yeah. He, w- what you did there was amazing. What you're doing for soccer is an amazing thing. But when I saw the video, it just seemed like you were living... You were at JFK. You were living in New York for a second, and then you moved to Jacksonville. Yeah. But you just went straight from JFK, 36 hours, and then you moved to yes. Jacksonville. That must have been rough. You know, so anybody comes to as a refugee to United States has uh, has a dream. Mm-hmm. You know, they're looking for a better life. Yeah. So at the time. We had no money, mm-hmm. me and my brother. My brother was my guardian. He was at the time 28 years old. Mm-hmm. And I remember we had no fear, but excitement. It's a, it's, you have that feeling. You know when you go for a first time to a theme park, mm-hmm. or a, like a park that you haven't been, or a t- vacation that you have no idea what it is, yeah. but all you expect is great things? Yeah. Because... Uh, you know, living in another country and watching American movies, hearing from your relatives living in states about America and what you see is, you know, skyscrapers, you know, all the, uh, gl- you know, bright and powerful thing that goes with America. So when you come as a refugee to this country, you just, you're excited. Yeah. So you're not worried about working hard. You're not worried about your next meal. You're excited about America. Yeah. I remember that excitement takes away all the fear and anxiety. You are fearful. You are anxi- anxious. Yeah. But the excitement overrides all those feelings. So we were coming and I was just excited. Well, what's going to happen next day? Oh, my God. Look at this new apartment, new people. You don't speak English. But you're like, oh, my God. Look at these people. <laughs> you know, like everything is new. Yeah. And once you deal with something that is everything is new and you have such a high expectation, which is set by all the movies and all the things that you heard about, yeah, it's, it's, it was exciting. When did you start playing soccer? When you were back in your home country? Or like, what, did you, what made you start to just start kicking a ball and made you fall in love? So my, my brother, the same guy that is my guardian, mm-hmm. he was my guardian, He's the guy who I looked up to. I mm-hmm. remember as long as I remember, whether it was, I remember seeing him just having a, a soccer bag, talking about soccer, going to training. How old are you when that? When, when, when? So he's 12 years older than me. So I oh. probably when he was 12, 13, 14, he was playing. I was two, three, four, or five. I remember just being involved with soccer, w- watching him watch soccer games. Mm-hmm. Like he became the guy that I looked up to. He, mm-hmm. he was always my idol. You know, mm-hmm. I wanted to be like him. Right. I even remember imitating the way he walked as a kid, you know. So, yeah, that's how I got into soccer. I remember he would come and I would ask him, hey, so how do you do this? Like, you know, I remember he, he taught me the coif turn. And I did that coif turn eight million times, I believe. Like, every day. To get it perfect, right? I didn't know what perfect was. I just liked doing it because I learned it from my brother. And mm-hmm. I remember when I would go watch him play in the fields... I would give him the ball because I remember he could kick the ball high, so high, and I would be amazed. I would keep running, he would kick it so far. And I would go run, run, run as a like four or five year old kid and bring it back and he would kick it again and I would just consist I could do that the whole day. You yeah. Know? Because it was so amazing. I would look at it, I'm like, oh my god, I wish I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Did he is he still playing now or No, he, he doesn't. No. He doesn't. Actually yesterday I was at his store, he has a seafood restaurant, I was you know, Bob's Crab House, you know, uh, I was there and I was helping him and he was saying, you know, I wish I could play because he was extremely talented. Yeah. He was like Messi or Maradona, like, you know, he's not tall like I am. He's short and very slow center of gravity, very quick. Mm -hmm. I remember up until we came to States when I was 16 years old, we would play together and I would always try to, you know, learn stuff from him. He was an amazing player, yeah. But he was talking about like how oh, I wish I started in a game and played. But you, you know, I was a kid, went to high school. Mm-hmm. But he came here, he had to be an adult. Yeah. And, you know, he would send money to my parents, and he had a, he had to be the man of the house, kind of. Yeah. So while I was playing soccer and stuff, he always focused on business and making money. Yeah. Yeah. To so meet all ends, meets and all that stuff. Absolutely. So he didn't play, but yeah. I understand that. You gotta do what you gotta do to feed yourself, feed family. All yeah, that stuff. so he focused on that, but I never lost my focus 
away from soccer. Even when I was in high school, I remember I thought, you know, everywhere I played as a kid, I was the star. Uh, even when in Turkey, when we were refugee, I remember these Turkish guys would come and take me to play. Like they would talk about, you know, want me to play for their team and stuff, like local pickup games or yeah, whatever. Yeah. So anywhere I played, I was so I always thought I'm going to be professional. Did you ever play with a club back in your Iran? Yes, I I was actually a captain of a U18 team as a 16 year old, 15 year old. We were training, getting ready for the season because we left Iran in the spring. Mm-hmm. And in the springs when you train and you start playing, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, we would go out of the town. We would meet up at a bus station. All the kids. We would go outside of the city to the fields. And we, we would train twice a week. And I remember, like, I was becoming to myself, you know, the year before when I was playing, I was very small. And in Iran, we didn't have U15, U16, U17 at the time. Yeah. In my city, we had these teams that we, coaches would put together. And we were a U18 team, but I was, like, 16, 15 years old, about to be 16. Yeah. And I remember, uh, this, like, I was, I was the guy at the team. You know? mm. And you can tell that from the way coach talks to you, the way every other player, you know, respects you. Yeah, I was just becoming to myself, like becoming, starting to be athletic, mm-hmm. uh, be, you know, the years before I was always had his skills and stuff. But you know, right now I coach you sixteen, and I can tell they're becoming powerful. They're starting to challenge me right. as their coach. Right. Where you fourteen, you thirteen, you fifteen, they kind of like you know you push them around and stuff. But now they're starting to challenge you I think I was that age that I left Iran that's you know, very in spurts, head. very interesting yeah that must but that that transition must have been rough because going from a different country not knowing a lick of English and then immediately go to Jacksonville when I moved to Jacksonville it just seemed like there was no diversity yeah and for you to come to, to a city like this like it's very hard Mm-hmm. Very hard, like, and when you, when you came to Jacksonville, was did you play club first or you went straight to high school? I never played club. I didn't even know what club soccer was. I mean, you got to realize, literally, you go to a completely new environment, new mm-hmm. culture. You have no idea. Look, when the guy that picked us up from airport in Jacksonville, when we landed in Jacksonville mm-hmm. for the first time. I remember my conversation because I was trying to practice English and pretending like I knew English talking to my brother and he was talking to me and I was talking back and my brother said so what did he said I said there is this company that we're gonna work for it for them and the guy who owns the company is an Iranian guy named Afshin okay Afshin is an Iranian name so my understanding of what he told me was that there's this company and we're gonna start working for them mm-hmm. I didn't know I can go to school I didn't know I can go play soccer I had no idea mm-hmm in retrospect that seems a little not wise but at the time what else I have no idea you know you don't even know where, where you're going yeah then I figured out that okay Lutron Social Service is a organization that settles refugee yeah I they're gonna help us settle Afshin is our caseworker who mm-hmm. takes care of our caseworker so mm-hmm. that was later on I understood what the guy said after a year or so that my English improved I met the same Russian guy. Mm-hmm. I guess he was Ukrainian, not Russian. Same Ukrainian guy. And I realized he barely speaks English. So the fact that I got that out of that conversation <laughs> was pretty amazing. <laughs> That's good. Turns out, I mean, everything turned out real well for you. <laughs> yeah. So the reason I talk about this is because you have no idea as a refugee. I mean, in Turkey for nine months, I was playing soccer. And I was working as a labor, as a... 15, 16 year old, how old was I? I was, I was 16 in Turkey, L- moving coals. I remember that even after I come home and shower, you could still, as if you have makeup around your eyes because of the cold dust sitting there. Uh, oh, you wow. don't know where you're going to go. Like, wow. what, 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 what you go through, like working and living with six different guys in a two bedroom house, apartment, and trying to just make days go by so you can come to United States as a mm-hmm. refugee go we went twice to US embassy back and forth during that nine month got accepted so you're not worried about anything you just you know my brother wanted to start work as soon as possible yeah I wanted to work too I actually went to, you know Afshin the caseworker mm-hmm. told me that you can 
go to high school, I was like, oh, that's awesome. I'm going to go to high school. Well, you know, they say they help you. They teach you English as a second language. I'm like, seriously? Like, these are all new. I have no idea. Yeah, the resources. Yeah. And then I got one, first thing I walked to the school, I was absolutely amazed how beautiful the school was. Mm-hmm. The classrooms. And then I was like, is this a school or is this an like Olympic village? Because we had basketball courts and soccer courts. It's not the case back home. You have a f- concrete field that you play everything on it. Basketball court, tennis court, pool. It looked like a, for an Iranian guy that came from a very... When we sit, we sit like, I remember four or five, four or four of us behind a you know, bench at the time. Like a, not a seat, benches in a classroom. Mm-hmm. For me, and then hearing that they say there's not enough funding for our school sometimes makes me like, wow, you know, Iranians, like some of the greatest students, like even back home, the kids are so good at school and education is so important. And I always find that a little uh, interesting about how we talk in America, despite like Inglewood, as you know, is one of the lower end school with less funding. Yeah. You know, it's not the... It's not Bartram Trail or Mandarin or Fletcher or, you know, it's less fun than the school as far as I know. And it was amazing to me. The school had everything. Yeah. It's crazy because you, for other people, like people here in Jacksonville, they would see that school and it's like, it's not well funded. Like you said, all that stuff. But for you, it's just like, you felt so rich yeah. being in that in that school i mean how was your high school experience throughout that like were you the bully were you the <laughs> class clown were you just someone who was just dedicated to their schoolwork and just go to school go to soccer practice after high school and then just go home or what was your experience like so my high school experience freshman and sophomore year is back home i wasn't necessarily a bully but i didn't bully people yeah but I always, so back home, you know, bo- only boys go to, in Iran, guys and guy, girls go separate to school. So in high school, it's almost like an educated jail. Like you have to find your hierarchy in the classroom, in the school. So the guys who are, you know, it's, I think it's the same thing in the States, like kids who want to mess around or like and they sit in the back of the classroom. Yeah. Good students sit in the front. Room. Yeah. I was always in the back of the class. Okay. I didn't bully people, but I, you know, I I stood my ground as a guy that who wanted to have his saying, you know, his, his respect, respect, turf, territory, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Especially as a soccer being the biggest sport back home, and me being one of the best players in the you know the school, yeah. that that gives you some bragging rights, yeah, you know, absolutely. But coming to states, it was completely different. Yeah. I was trying to find my place at the time. I was a guy who wanted to go to boxing, fought a lot, mm-hmm. you know in the classrooms and you know in a street come to the guy that you know that's you can't do those anymore yeah you know you're trying to learn the language and yeah in, the only way you're going to do that is being friends with the kids in the esol english as a second language so you're c- taken out of from a gangster crowd put into all these refugee kids who are nice and like you know as a refugee you're timid yeah you don't speak the language yeah. you don't have you're in a different country so you completely changed my life. If I stayed back home, God knows what I would have been. Yeah. But I came to America and then I wanted to, all I wanted to play soccer because that was the only thing I was good at. So you did all your talking on the field? In a say, like I wa- that was how I could express myself. Yeah. There was no other way. You yeah. know? I wasn't an artist. I, wasn't a, I didn't speak English. And I would try to be funny with the English as a second language class. I would still had my aggression of wanting to fight and stuff but soon I realized you it's know, not the it's, case it's not the case and I didn't have to like people you know they, because the kids in the school who were mm-hmm. football players and baseball players and they had their own crowds that I was not invited nor I felt comfortable around them you know I, yeah. I, I didn't speak English Yeah. so Inglewood was funny I remember clearly we had group of white cr- or group white kids then you had the group of black kids, yeah. football players and stuff. White kids mostly were baseball players and some of the football players. Uh, then you had Hispanics, mm-hmm. huge Hispanic group that they were always together. And then you had everybody else, refugees mm-hmm. who weren't Hispanic. Mm-hmm. So I rolled with the uh, Bosnian kids. Mm-hmm. I rolled with Albanian kids mm-hmm. like who we felt comfortable. And we had some African kids and mm-hmm. some... Uh, uh, 
you know, Hispanic kids, even though they were refugees because they spoke, they, you know, there was a lot of them. Yeah. They had their own group. But everybody else refugees, Syrians, Iraqis, Iranians, yeah. Bosnians, Albanians, we had our own group. And what brought us together, the language was soccer, you know. And you guys ended up winning... We, we you won districts or my senior year we won districts we were very good i'm telling you we just needed a leader like some and we had a good leader at, at a coach especially my senior year coach winston mm -hmm. but um uh, and uh, my friend my best friend uh, locally uh, that i've known him for 20 years vania turuncic he was our assistant coach so he knew soccer but he was a 19 year old kid how much soccer does he know you know compared to Oh, you know? he was young. Oh, yeah, he was, a, he he was, was just out fresh of high out. School. Yeah. yeah, he was a couple of years. He's two years older than me. Yeah. So he didn't know much, but he tried to help. We had our coach Vincent. So, what I'm saying, if you had a coach who understood the game mm -hmm. and could had the same leadership skills that Coach Vincent had, yeah. we would have won the state probably fairly easily. Yeah. You know, but we lost because, you know, we didn't train like. You know, it's different when you know the game. You you set the team. You mo you know you get you know where, how to get the guys to play certain ways. We didn't have that, but we had a good leader at Coach Winston, and we did really well. We won the district. Mm -hmm. We lost, I think, in the second round of stage state yeah. playoffs. We were amazing. Tommy Kruzanovic, uh who me him and I we went to we played together at JU at Armada, and right now. He's, uh, he's at JFC. He's, uh, he's our academy director. He played for that high school team. Oh, wow. So, such a small town. <laughs> yeah. Such a small Especially town. Especially when it comes to soccer. Yeah. It's expanding, but it's such a small community. Yeah. But I would say right now it's getting bigger and bigger. But We'll get more time. into that yeah. in a second. Uh -huh. But with Inglewood, after those, those losses, did you just sit back and relax and just like appreciate everything or were you immediately back in the gym training training right after those you know those tough losses yeah so now here is like you know we, earlier we were speaking to you um, at the starbucks i remember telling you like you know what it takes to be a pro and stuff shout out to starbucks I, by the way yeah. <laughs> sponsor us sponsor us please <laughs> we need everything <laughs> I, you know i was telling you that uh it takes more than just being a good soccer player, having mentor, I didn't have a mentor. Yeah. So my mentors, the guy that who helped me the most was my buddy, who was I told you two years old, or older than me, Ivania. Yeah. But he didn't have a life experience who could help me. He was helping me just because he cared for me. Mm -hmm. But he didn't know how to like training. You, you're mentioning training. Did I train? I remember after we lost in playoffs, we were all crying, including our coach, Coach Vincent. I was crying. I was crying. We were crying because we lost in the playoffs. Yeah. And I was our senior year. Yeah. But after that, I trained. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was training. I would just go kick out, kick the ball, play street soccer, try to juggle. Yeah. I, I became really good at freestyling just mm -hmm. because of those days. Because I had no idea what to train. And that's what I try to teach my boys. Like I sit down and tell them exactly what they knew. I even set down cones, count the steps. I tell them this is what you can do yeah. to improve this. Yeah. How you can improve your passing. Right. How you can improve your long passes, driven passes. So I didn't have those kind of mentors. So I wish I could find me which i think i have i have few players who are similar to me yeah that i can mentor them and teach them what to do yeah but yeah i, I never stopped training but and then after high school did you play anywhere for your freshman year of college or like how was that process from after high school like because you say you were just freestyling you're just doing kickabouts what at what point was college was like in your in your future like what who was the coach that got you into college soccer or who put you into that direction uh, so it was a shock for me once high school finished then I start playing I remember I couldn't get into JU because NCAA has this clearing house the draft that four English four math this yeah yeah forget yeah. about the school yeah JU actually accepted me because I, I was able to actually score uh, FCAT is that FCAT? Yes, yeah, FCAT. Yeah. I passed FCAT as if like exactly if the passing score was seven hundred or something. Mm -hmm. I scored exactly that. And I remember my 
uh, my advisor, my counselor, she was running in the hallway telling me, Remy, you graduated high really? school. Because if you don't, you go through it. She was so, and I was amazed because I would always miss the first two blocks of the school. Somehow I graduated. <laughs> I think it had a lot to do with my um, strong background in math. Mm -hmm. And they allowed us to use dictionary. Somehow I passed. Okay. I graduated high school. And I remember after that, I was like, okay, I'll go to college. I went to JU, they didn't accept me. I went to Embry Riddle, they, did, they, give, they wanted to give me a scholarship, they, I couldn't get in. Flagler, same thing, mm -hmm. my academics wasn't good enough. That was when I realized, oh, remember, I was wanted to be professional and I just didn't care about the school. Mm -hmm. There is no path. And I was naive. Like, just like the, the way I didn't know how America was, I didn't know how you can grow to become a professional. There was yeah. no path. And if you don't go to college, you, you have to stop playing soccer. And that's what happened. For two years, I didn't play soccer. I was working full time at Domino's, mm -hmm. delivering pizza. What? Oh yeah. Oh my For years, god. I at Domino's, and I you, did you feel so dead end working at uh, Domino's, or were you, like when you were working at Domino's, were you just always thinking about soccer? thinking about it I had a ball so in Domino's at night you wait for your manager to close out the cash register yeah, and everything yeah. and you they t go to bank to drop make a deposit at yeah. night and they expect the drivers to stay you know you get paid you stay and you mm -hmm. follow the manager so he can drop the money it's like a safety process mm -hmm. and at the time we were getting way more cash than nowadays yeah and I remember I would I had a ball for 45 minutes I would train in the uh, Domino's parking lot and I broke dollar I don't remember dollar tree sign I I would just const I would be soaked when my manager would come out and I was just playing with my Domino's clothes I don't remember we had khaki pants yeah Domino's blue top and I would play with that you know by yourself just, or with uh, co-workers no no co-workers that would sometimes there would be a co-worker they didn't want to play I was the only guy I was 19 years old out of high school so it took two years for me to get into college Wow. And the process was like I would go watch Tommy, my buddy at JU, and they were playing, and I'm like, I was watching. I'm like, oh my god, like you can feel you're out there. The yeah. game that you grow up and loving and yeah. crying and cheering. And yeah. I mean, this soccer defines me. It's yeah. everything for me. And I would go watch them play, watch Tommy play, and I'm like, no, I'm not playing. I'm just in Domino's playing Sunday league. Uh, I was just very sad. And I tried. I went to Embry Riddle. I went to Flagler. Those are the only thing I knew. Ju, UNF. None of them could. How would you me. find out about those tryouts or like? Those I would just call colleges. Oh, I would okay. Just find out who the coach is. Uh, you know, and I I don't recall, but maybe some people helped me. But I clearly remember how Mike Johnson. Yeah. T called me and he said, "Hey, Remy, there is a college in Georgia." called Thomas University and they have an NAIA school yeah. mm -hmm. you know I know the coach I can set up a trial for you maybe you go there for a year and then you transfer to JU I was like yeah coach I'll do it and this is two years I'm working at Domino's and he, he but he knew me for years that, and I still played man's league and people could see me in man's league yeah. oh, Remy you know he's special if he has a good coach or you know he's got skills you know blah blah, blah. He, and then and the funny thing is I owe him everything that I have right now as a soccer player because if that didn't happen maybe I would have been in right now I owed owe the location of a Domino's or maybe <laughs> my life was, no I knew soccer wouldn't be part of it it would be just a man's league yeah, yeah, yeah. but he called me and you know what's crazy this yeah. morning when we went to Lasco Park to meet over there yeah. I went and I saw him so I have a oh, little short man. video that I recorded him and I because we have a group of us in college together and I send it there. So this morning I saw Mike Johnson, the guy who is the reason I today I am coaching and I played pro and I played college. So yeah, I went to, uh, to, to try out to Thomas University and that's how I got back into soccer. And I remember driving to Thomas University, a couple of exits, I was like, I'm wasting my time. They're not going to take me. I don't have grades. Should I go back? Like, okay, and the longer I went, the longer it was for me to make a U turn. I went to try out, the coach gave me a big scholarship at the time. The school cost eight thousand, he gave me six. And I remember uh, Pell Grant at the time was four, four grand, four thousand, forty two hundred. Yeah, and I got extra money to be able to pay for lunch and stuff. I remember at the time it was awesome. So I got a full ride going to college and I get to do what I love. And I remember I wasn't even sure if I was in. 
was so nervous. First training, so I'm, 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 I'm in. First game, when I played the first game, I was like, oh yeah, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in college. You're good, you're good. <laughs> How was your college experience at Thomas? Like, was it amazing? You, amazing? Amazing. Best experience ever? It's. As far I, as soccer? As far as soccer, it was. It was best experience ever, not because of the circumstance, not because necessarily it was a, I loved my coach, I loved my team, but it wasn't like, well, I wasn't in Old Trafford, it was a small town. <laughs> no, I've been, I've been to uh, Thomas and their, their, their facility, everything, amazing. It's amazing, but what I'm saying is that it wasn't like, you. I wasn't in this school that we get 5,000, 10,000 fans or whatever, nah. it was just a college team, but because how I got there, mm -hmm. it, it couldn't be better than that. It's almost like, you know, when you're hungry, any tea, any food can taste like a steak. <laughs> you're hungry. <laughs> yeah, so ramen I was noodles. hungry. I was wanted to play soccer. And I remember because I had a bad experience of not being able to go to college because of education. Yeah. And I wanted to transfer to J JU. MJ told me you have to have good grades. My graduating, my f freshman gra uh, GPA was 9.6, 3.96 or 3.9. Oh, 9. 9. Something very high. What? I had one A minus, 3.9 you know nine or some, some yeah. percentage so because of that i was able to come to ju and not even have a soccer scholarship because i got such a huge academic and you know yeah, yeah. pell grant and stuff so helped me to be able to be able to play uh, soccer for ju without a scholarship and but it helped the team even though thomas was such a small school and it's just naia like people people like when they watch espn they see ncaa did you did you appreciate the NAIA league? Like it taught Absolutely, you yeah. everything because sometimes kids don't appreciate something like a school like that. Because I remember when I went to my school in Georgia, they were in the same league as Thomas, and when I didn't see NCAA, I I didn't appreciate it at all. I was like, no, man, I this is this is not a this is not a league that's not going to get you anywhere. You're just going to go for the the education, which I was I was grateful for. But it's like you also have that mindset of you want to be professional, and you want to be at the highest level. Of a professional where people can like in MLS or in Europe can see, of course. And but with NAIA, is that something that you just didn't take uh, for granted at all? It was something that you appreciated and took advantage of it. Oh, like, there's nothing to take for granted. Like I'm, I am in. Like it was the best thing that could have happened. I, I did. I, I remember every morning I got up in front of uh, the house. I rented a room from a professor and a librarian they were married one of them was a ge uh, history professor professor mm -hmm. and the uh, lady was our book bookstore uh, key, you know lady and I lived at their house and I was renting a room mm -hmm. every morning I got up I did my drum prop every night I did my push-ups and sit-ups suddenly I became from a guy that couldn't in the beginning of the year we had a fitness test 10 120s mm -hmm. I did five of them and the sixth one a half day I stopped because I was so out of shape mm -hmm. by spring I was always finishing first I was always flying first I got six pack I was you, you, you gotta realize I think sometimes having bumps in life the obstacles mm -hmm. there's a book it's called obstacles the way it is the way because that obstacles made me appreciate what I had. Sometimes it's good to go through tough times. It's always good to go through tough times because then you don't value what you have. So for people who don't appreciate NAIA is because I think they didn't go through what I went through. To me, it was the best thing ever. And I remember I worked so hard and I, and I think NAIA is capable of producing professional players mm -hmm. because we played, I remember against this team that has a bunch of Icelandic guys, I forgot the name, but they were all adults because NAIA doesn't have the restriction that NCAA has. Yeah. And we were playing against ex-pros. At the end of the game, they were hugging their kids and stuff. And they beat us 5-0 or 5-1. Oh, my God. But my point is, as a... Look, opportunities are important. Mm -hmm. But any opportunity can get you where you want. Whether it's playing for top 10 elite Mm -hmm. NCAA Division One team yeah. or playing for NAIA. There are professional guys go from NAIA. So I do think that it's more about having that path mm -hmm. which NAIA provides that mm -hmm. and then you do your part. Like you can't do it if you're playing for men's league, especially at the time. Right now you can, there are UPSLs, you can work, you can train, you can go here and there and maybe go try for a professional team and go. Yeah. But at the, as long as you have a path, it's all up to you. Are you going to get up in the morning and do your jump rope? Are you going to do your push-ups and sit up every night? Are mm -hmm. you going to eat well? Are you going to watch games? Are you going to evaluate what you're doing? Are you going to go back see what can I improve? Now, at the time, I didn't notice. I worked hard, hard, hard without 
realizing what it takes I didn't like I said I didn't have a mentor but if you have right mentors and right now you have everything it takes to be a professional soccer player in the city of Jacksonville yeah and NAIA did have those those people to help you out in the right direction or did you sometimes have to do it on your own because I know NCAA they have trainers they have all this stuff to help you out and to get into that right direction to get to that professional level yeah did Thomas at least provide something like that I mean Thomas didn't didn't like was like Thomas provided everything that Ju did. I you know like I don't think there is there was much difference at the time. Mm-hmm. Now it might be a slightly different, you know, because it's been many years mm-hmm. since. But you know, right now with internet, like you know, right now with internet, you can literally study any subject mm-hmm. and be very good at it yeah you can really teach yourself anything you can fix cars what i'm saying if you dedicate yourself there's education tools out there to be there are free colleges online yeah, yeah. so what i'm saying is like right now at the time there was no so in order for me to be professional i had to travel seven hours to raleigh pay for the tryout you know we haven't got there but what I'm saying is that at the time was hard, but even if you can make it to pros at the time, mm-hmm. when, I, when I was out there, mm-hmm. right now it's a piece of cake. Mm. But you, right now you have a much stiffer competition. You everybody everybody's knows doing how it. to train. There are good coaches every city. There's good programs everywhere. There are good teams everywhere. But again, I think nothing's changed. If you are willing to put the work in, yeah. dedicate yourself, mm-hmm. you can become a professional soccer player. No matter where you're at. No. You can. Right now, it's easier than... Like, right now, I wish I came to state when I was 17 years old today. Mm. I mean, I would have made a living out of soccer as far as playing and maybe retired at you know, young age. I Literally, like, look remember, the years of 16, 17, 18, 19, mm-hmm. 20, 21, six years of your life that you learn soccer, you mm-hmm. grow, you become better. I was playing men's league and, you know, here, high school... Those years right now, you play like my boys, you 17s, you 16s, they play against the top competition, MLS clubs and stuff. Like right now, there is possibilities are endless. Yeah. And for six years of your best years, I wasn't playing soccer. Instead of learning how to check to the spaces, check, receive the ball, know aware, be aware of your surroundings, release the ball, work on your touch. All those years went to waste for me, and I still made it to pro. Now imagine right now, you bring a guy who has the ability and teach him all these things for. Oh my God, sky is the limit now. Now, and with Thomas, you transferred to Ju. Yes. How was your experience at Ju? Was it different from from Thomas, or was yeah. it just everything was all natural from that transition? Uh, no, the transition was fairly smooth. You're in college team. You get to know new guys, mm-hmm. um, new environment. I was more comfortable because I had more, you know, to begin with because I knew I'm in. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew the players. Some of the players, like uh, Tommy was still there. He was a senior when I got there as a sophomore. He was his last year. My, it was my sophomore year. Yeah, yeah. Remember, it took me two years to get into college. Yeah, yeah. So I knew some of the guys at JU. It was good. Like my MJ, the guy who helped me, yeah. gets to coach me now. Yeah. That was cool. Uh, yeah, it was awesome. I think, but I was more focused at Thomas because of the... Just th- there was no friends like you know I had uh, to my teammates were friends but it was such a small community that was perfect for somebody who wanted to stay focused at JU I was focused mm-hmm. but I did have more uh, friends my brother my friends my cousins to go to their house and stuff so th- there was more reason to be distracted yeah. than Thomas but yeah JU was an amazing experience like I, I was telling you earlier like my senior year at JU we won the conference and we went to nationals we won the first round we went to the second round and we mm-hmm. lost to UNC Chapel Hill who won who went to final and lost in final that year and we they barely beat us 1-0 and I was injured that game oh so you didn't get to play I didn't play that game I was the top scorer in the team that game before I scored against Louisville we beat Louisville and that game I, it was my hip flex it wasn't even a bad injury it was just yeah. like one of those injuries needed a 10 day rest 7 day rest mm. but you know when you make it to NCAAs every 4 days or so you have a game yeah, yeah, those so back-to-back I, days are crazy. Yeah. I could not, I could not adjust to that at all. Injuries would happen. I would have black toes. Yeah, I would have, I would have bruises out of nowhere and in different places. I just, I did not like it. For me, college experience was something different. I think I was just 
uh, like you said, you have to have the right mentors and you have to have the right mentality. Yeah. I didn't have the right mentality because I was not used to waking up at 6 a.m. in the morning yeah, yeah. to go to practice. Like, And then the first training, I wasn't used to that, uh, to the fitness. Oh, yeah. The first day, I was vomiting, vomiting every single minute of just of the last five minutes of practice just every every single second minute i was like i can't i can't do this college I don't. preseason is tough college very preseason tough. because yeah. they have such a short season so they try to squeeze the fitness in first two weeks now i don't know scientifically and based on your body and stuff how good that is but you're right the preseason for college at the time was brutal but there's a big difference between high school and college oh absolutely <laughs> very big difference but i feel like you have to really mentally prepare yourself like in that summer going from high school to college i didn't do that yeah i was just like all right let's just sit back relax enjoy the summer i mean <laughs> it's cool to have a, uh, a school waiting for you and you immediately get to play soccer but it takes a lot of discipline oh yeah a lot of discipline to really be a winner in, in this type of environment i mean you know we were talking about high school college you know it takes a lot of discipline but in any level you want to succeed the teams that has discipline will succeed. Like, you might not win a national championship, but you will succeed compared to, let's say, the year before. You yeah. will succeed. Discipline, dedication, hard work might not produce championship results because maybe you don't have certain players, maybe you don't have, you know, sometimes you get unlucky. But I can guarantee you, if you get a team or a player or people, group of guys to be disciplined, train, and give everything they have, mm -hmm. you will succeed. I, I mean, it's almost like a, have, being successful is very easy, yet it's very hard. It's like playing soccer. It's easy and it's the best when you play simple, but it's difficult to play simple. Like yeah. the word simple, it can be uh, a little you know distracting not yeah. distracting what's the word it could be um little i don't know what the word is but it can be deceiving yeah. because you can oh it's simple yeah what, what do we you know assign simplicity with or it's you assign it with sitting relaxing yeah that's not the, what i'm saying is like for example if you want to solve the quadratic equation it is seems difficult or i mean I'm, like let's say okay, you want to send a rocket to space it's difficult sometimes you got to go back to the basics no, but, but, but the, the, that's the simplicity like you can break down every tax to these simple blocks once you've broken into simple blocks do you have the discipline to get it done every day every week but what but that's simple you're doing the simple things but getting up at 6 a.m like you were mentioning it's not hard hard is going to war and putting your life in danger hard yeah. is feeding being a single mom and feeding three kids getting up at six morning is not hard that is simple mm -hmm. it's simple to get up in the morning you go to training after training you come home you do your homework you make sure you get a small nap at night you go to bed on time they're difficult in a sense but they're simple making a pass under pressure to five yard pass to your teammate it's simple but it's difficult because of the circumstances yeah. that you have but if you do it repetitively and you get stick to it Life is simple. Success is simple, but yet it is difficult. Yeah. Soccer is simple, but mm -hmm. it's difficult to play it simple. Correct. So all I'm saying is like, what you like you're asking about, you know, can you make it as an NAIA player? And yes, you can make it as a men's league player, but can you men's league player get up every day, train, go pra practice in the evening, and go on Sunday and stay disciplined and do what he's supposed to do, yeah. and then try to find a semi-pro team and do the same thing, and then go to it's i remember when i was in our uh carolina railhawks i didn't do the simple things right the reason because i was mentally wasn't ha prepared for that level i didn't have support system yeah i didn't have a mentor like you it is simple but you have to have the right stuff around you so after J ju you graduated all that you did you, you did you did graduate right oh absolutely oh, okay Three, two, i graduated my undergrad i graduated with three point five gpa and um, I, ha I got my master's mba from ju as well because which i was the assistant coach for yeah. the team yeah that's how i got i got they paid for it i you know focused on leadership mba and focused on leadership i didn't know because sometimes these some college players they just go ahead and go right to the professional league without graduating no. uh, but 
after graduation, you still wanted you were looking to play professional. Absolutely. So, in the documentary you did with um, with Jack, you mentioned you went to go try out with New England. How did how did you get to that point? My coach Mike Johnson MJ set it up. Some he had a connection that saw me play, and they were like, okay, you know, let's send him to New England and. You know, Liverpool legend Stevie Nichol. Mm-hmm. He yeah, was the yeah. head coach. So oh, oh, I got yeah, to sp- oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, I got to that. spend a week with them first time. They liked me. They flew me back after um, I was done with college because yeah. I had some tests and stuff my senior year. Yeah, they flew me back and I went there. Spent good two weeks there. Not only he was the head coach, our captain who was at the time he was having a concussion problem. You know yeah. him, Tyler. Tyler Twelman. Yeah, Tyler Twelman. He was our captain. I remember one time I finished and he's like, oh, that's a good finish. Charlie Joseph was the star of the show oh, at the wow. time. Oh, yeah. Like, I had a you great... saw everybody there, huh? Yeah, and I remember we would come out of training. We would have uh, like a lunch prepared for us. And uh, we had a nutrition lady who was talking to us. Everything was so professional in the locker room. They're getting these cleats for free. I remember Tyler Twelman was throwing boxes of free cleats to his teammates. Like, I don't want this because he was, he had, he was like the big dog in the locker room you know <laughs> so those kind of exper- that that was the experience that hey you know those you do want to be part of that yeah you, know, you want to be professional that's that's the everyone's dream every Absolutely. soccer player's dream now how long was that process like the tryout was it like a weekly camp thing or was it just like a two-day thing or like no no i was one you know it's all the way to boston so i was there first time for seven days second mm-hmm. time i think for 14 days and uh i remember i had a meeting with Stevie Nichol and he told me look Remy you, he, I want a starter at the time I was a striker as a senior in college it's like I want a starter I want somebody to come have, have an impact mm-hmm. and you know and he said you're not going to start you're going to be one of my guys who are good enough to be at the bench but not good enough to make a change for our team and he was right 100% spot on and at the time MLS didn't have second team reserve oh, they God. got away with it that, those years so now, if right now you go, if I had the same guy, and at the time I was 25 years old, yeah, I graduated yeah. college late because he started when I was 21. Yeah, yeah. But he, he, I, I could feel that in your training and stuff, I wasn't far off. Yeah. I was good. I was anything that was better skilled more, compared to most guys. Athletic. I just didn't understand the game. I wasn't reading the game. Yeah. Um, and that's those six years of that I was telling you, missing playing and missing being coach and playing men's league. I hit those you. Years, yeah. Oh, if I had those years, I I would have been the guy that he was looking for. Probably I would have gone directly to pros and didn't have to coach college if I, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, you know, yeah. those years I was being developed. Yeah. Like right now in our team, in our club, JFC, the things that we teach these guys, the things that we, we go through to make them if I had the same coaching that JFC provides, I would have been a pro right after, you know, youth level. Right. Because just, you know, I had it. Yeah. But it took me years of college and, you know, going there to be able to, obviously they didn't sign me and I went, two weeks later, I went to Carolina Railhawks. But yeah. that must have hit you hard. Like how close you were to just be playing with New so England. So close. I remember I came home I start looking online, googling the teams close to me. I find Miami at the time. I think it was like a Miami United. Yeah. Do you want to go to Shade? You want to go to Shade? Oh no, Shade is fine. I'm yeah. fine here. I'm fine. Okay. Yeah. So Hold on, let me see if it's making sure it's recording. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I I looked Miami United. I mm-hmm. I remember with the local team I. Jacksonville, we made it to playoffs of the Open Cup, and we played against them. We went to their facility. That was just like a not pro and I, I i went to new england yeah you know revolution yeah seeing that i was like i don't want to go there because at the time i'm feeling i can make it then i looked at it was a trial for carolina railhawks i looked them up they looked legit like good team i went it was 200 dollars for a tryout paid trial or something i paid Jeez. it went drove there same thing like college it's, it's been consistently just me chasing after my dream you know it's not easy nobody's gonna hand it to you Went there in a triad, there was like 200 people, but I was head and shoulder above all, obviously all these guys that wanted to try it, and most of them didn't, weren't, couldn't even play a man's league. And the coach saw me, he's like, hey, what is your name? I told him I just, and I think the fact that I was in New England and I had a trial with them, 
I told him, he's like, okay. He looked at me, watched me one more day, and he told me, next week, come to the team training. And I went, guess what I did? I was like, I'm just gonna pack as if they're gonna give me a contract. I packed and I went there. Tried out, they gave me a contract. And I stayed at Raleigh. Yeah. And that's how my first professional contract was. But he didn't sign me as a striker. He signed me as a right back. Yeah. So he gave me, he, I started playing a right back. And uh, yeah, and that's how I got my first pro contract. I mean, how was that experience being finally a pro at that level and just, you know, being in a stadium full of people and seeing you play? How was that? It was, you know, it was your dream coming true. You know, Very emotional, I, huh? I, I, I just remember when I was, when I made it, I was driving and I felt like I'm in clouds and I'm like, my God. Imagine, I'm 25 years old. I should be getting a job, per se. Like, you know, college is done. 25-year-old, who goes for pros at 25 years yeah. old? I got a pro contract, and I was just, just very happy. Like, I was... It's just like 25 years, let's say 21 years, because you're four years old, you remember. Yeah. Of dream comes true. Yeah. You get to be like I'm getting paid to play soccer yeah you know I just never forget that moment like I remember everything about that day yeah it was a amazing experience and it, look the odds of me being pro being a refugee not speaking English not having parents yeah compared to a parent, kid who is good and who has all those his odds are very small I literally throw everything in and I made it and I like I, and I know like maybe after college if I got a job and stuff maybe right now I had more money I was maybe a were you scared to spend that two hundred dollars on that tryout? No, I, I never cared about money. Like never uh. scared of. I, even to this day, I it's to me right now I'm thirty seven. I don't make a lot of money coaching soccer. I don't being part of soccer, but I get to do what I love every day. Yeah. And I know you listen to these successful people and gurus and they tell you you just gotta do what you love and believe in it it's easy once you do once you do what you love there's always gonna be obstacles but it just makes life a whole lot easier yeah there's always temptation of oh should I get a day job make this much money do this do that but the day the minute that you give in to temptation you're done you're mm. not chasing your dream and right now my dream is to coach I'm living my dream and my dream is like honestly I used to be like oh I want to coach be a coach of Man United or you know Premier League you know just like the way you want to play coach play for Barcelona coach Barcelona right 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 when I originally started coaching that was my dream but right now I live my dream I get to have have an impact in young men's life and you know when you go to US courses you have an option of going a, getting an A license in adult or youth I think I'm gonna I, I know I'm gonna do youth because I think that's where I needed the help. I want to be part of that. And my dream is to coach U U.S. national team, youth national team. Yeah, yeah. Because I feel like I know what it takes to be a successful soccer player. And that's mm -hmm. the age that I'm really good at. And I, my, I dream of, of coaching U.S. national team in a youth World Cup and winning the national, you know, World Cup, the youth national team. Because so how long were you at uh, the Red Hawks? One one season. One eight season. Eight months, or whatever that was. Yeah. And after that, what were you doing between then? Where it was because there must have been a gap between then and was, between the Red Hawks and then you playing for Armada. Was there? It was a, it was a gap? Few years gap. Two three. Few years, years. Two years, I think. Now here's what happened. Like. Whoa, that's a long time. You know, at the Red Hawks, I think I made. I was making fifteen hundred dollars a month, two thousand dollars a month. You don't make enough money. You're not playing. You you don't have an agent. I didn't have an agent. I didn't have somebody. I didn't have. My parents were still back home. Yeah. It's difficult. I had. I was having a difficult time. I wasn't playing. I was like, you know, professional life seems you know glamorous and stuff, but it's so difficult. If you're not playing, you want to play. When I mean, you're playing, you're worried about your spot. It's your job. So, it's. It was difficult. I mean, I had a hard time. 
I went on a loan to Charlotte Eagles. I actually played eight. I started eight games as a right back for right. Charlotte Eagles. We mm -hmm. played against Bolton, the English team, Bolton. Oh, one. nice. So I remember I played, you know, in that game. I have great memories from playing for Real Hawks, but it's not, it wasn't easy. Then once they didn't renew my contract, I came back to Jacksonville and I was still wanted to play. But my friends, my best, one of my best friends, his name is George Barry. He's an orthopedic surgeon now. His dad, who's a surgeon, opened a gym, Pulse Fitness, and I started working there. And even though I was working at the gym, I was a general manager. I was running the, every aspect of the gym. But my, every evening I was going to coach, mm -hmm. youth. Mm -hmm. I, I knew it was not what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a soccer guy. Play, still, because you're still like yeah. your peak. Yeah, and then I got a you know luck of the draw Armada came to city I went to tryouts and stuff and I made it you just found out on your own yeah I mean it was pretty well known that Armada bringing a pro team to the city you know it's, and uh, I wanted to try out and they gave me a contract and I got to play against you know a friendly game against Boca that's that's the highlight of my pro career that's that was that's what I wanted to get into was that how you? How was your experience with trying out for Armada, playing for Armada? Like, how long? Like, how many games did you even play with Armada? I only played one game, like a regular season game. Okay. And how was that experience? Like playing with Ar the Armada. Uh, my, my first year. Spill the beans because I want to hear everything about Armada. Because <laughs> hearing a team, hearing a professional team here in Jacksonville, was amazing to me. Yeah. But then next thing you know, after what, two seasons, it just folded. Yeah. I didn't have enough answers, but I, that was because I was still in college. I didn't have time to just read into that. I was just like, all right, that sucks. Yeah. That, that, that just, that was, that was a nice little thing. But now that's gone, it kind of gave up hope for Jacksonville as a soccer city. Mm -hmm. But, and that's why I want to know, like, how was that experience working with a team like that, getting like really in, in deep with the team and the, the staff, all that stuff? Armada was interesting. I remember we start training somewhere in shoot, September. I think September. Okay. To, I don't remember what year it was, honestly. And we trained for five months, and we would go every day train. Yeah. And during those times, the coaches would change. First, we had uh, these two guys, one from, I think, both from Spain, Nando... I forgot their names. They were uh, coaching us, two young guys. I mean, we thought they're gonna be head coach and assistant coach. I remember you guys had a head coach that trained Messi. Yeah. yeah. Or he was used to be at Barcelona or something yeah, like yeah. that? Okay. That that's the guy that coached us finally during the season. Okay. But after that we got this uh guy who came, he was supposed to be our head coach, but by the time the season started he got pushed down and we got Hoyes, Bochi Hoyes. Okay. That that's the guy that coached Messi and stuff. Okay. Uh, you know, building teams are very difficult. I had this experience with inner jacks, and okay. you, even youth teams that I have. It, it, there's no difference. Every team has a process. There's a process of you forming the team. Like these kids, they get together, mm -hmm. and there's this period of people trying to figure it out each other. Like who's the you know who's gonna be part of the team and stuff. And then you kind of build the team. If the team successful, become successful, they start you know playing and performing good. I don't think Armada ever got to that performing part stage. They were always in the part that is called in a team building process called storming. There were there was always a storm in Armada. We never had a good team the year that I was there. The locker room was divided between half of the kids that were mostly Hispanic, especially Argentinians, mm -hmm. because the coach was Argentinian and the agent, G GM was Argentinian, so we had a heavy Argentinian influence, and the other half were Americans and, you know, some Africans and me and Bosnians and, you know, Tommy, Croatian. So it was a, it was a divided team, and the team will not succeed. I don't care if you have Messi in one side of the divide and Ronaldo in the other side of the divide of one team. You will not succeed if everybody's not have a common purpose and fighting. You can have some of the best players, and even if they get, they might get some results, but they would not be a team. Team is teams building them is difficult, but once they become a team, it's a sheer force that nobody can stop it. Nobody, no matter how good the team, other teams are, if they're not as good of a team. Team. Uh, Armada never had that in my first year I was there. 
there was so much conflicts between managers, owners, GMs, players. So we never performed, and our results reflected that. Mm. And uh, I never knew the results. Like, was it just a a lot of losses. losses? The coach got fired close to the end of season. I got let go two games before the season. The you know, it was just a mess. So after so the Boca was the only game you played, or you played Not one more game? Real game. We played against I think New York, and I got subbed in the last twenty minutes. Uh-huh. I played all the friendly games, and Boca was a friendly game. I, I, and I think it wasn't my ability that I didn't play. Mm-hmm. I just think the politics of the game, and I'm not very. I'm a even to this day. I'm not very po- political. I don't. I have a hard time being nice to somebody in order to get the playing time, or you know, I just wanted to play, work hard, and get my chance. Yeah. You know? And it never happened. And because of the politics of the team, didn't help my case either. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of thing going on in background. With contracts, agent mm. fees, coaches, payments. Um, Did you I, even get paid? Yeah, when? we all got paid. Armada oh. always paid everybody. Okay. Armada, if anything about Armada, even to this day, I know they paid everybody. You know, mm. it wasn't paying. It was just like a became. I don't know. Like I, I think, mean, it kind of goes back to the same thing, especially when you say team. There was, like, was there that was there that that discipline. The discipline was there, or was it just everything was like really nonchalant? But you know, when you deal with adults or even youth or anybody, discipline comes, team comes first, and then discipline comes. There's a discipline to get the team together, but it's an art. It's an art to get the players together, believe in the common goal, right? Get them fights, right? And they didn't have that. Our coach didn't speak English, which I don't think that's the reason. I think, yeah. uh, you know. First of all, everybody should be should feel like you're they're part of the team. Even right, right, the right. last guy, mm-hmm. you know, I'm a huge believer of in this saying that it says you're as strong as your weakest link. Mm-hmm. If your weakest link, the guys that they don't play are not hundred percent bought into the team idea, you won't succeed. If your guys up top are not fighting for every ball and every you know opportunity to help the team it won't succeed it's it, was just, ho- it's, it was just a snowball effect from then yeah like everybody was just going down 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 at that point there's a reason these big guys in top teams like uh coaches zidans and guardiolas and clubs they make so much money because it's hard yeah especially when you deal with guys who are so making much millions of dollars and they're already famous they can just shut down and just make enough money from their instagram account to live their life so what I'm saying is like building teams hard and Armada struggled in that first year which is normal for a first year but that the, the, there was no continuity to build so it was difficult and I know now they, right now they had a U23 this summer yeah and I think there there's talks that they're gonna come back yeah and hopefully uh, I know one of the guys Nathan Edwards mm-hmm. who is who was involved at the time and he's the president right now. He's been through all these ups and downs. And I think he can be the guy that can put the team together, learning from those experiences. Uh, do, so you, do, they come do, back. You, do you believe, when you say come back, do you have hopes that they would come back into uh, a, at least a USL league or maybe even possibly an MLS team? Like, I don't know the process at all, but knowing how much this city has grown in soccer do you think there's a do you think there's a possibility that there's an mls team coming to jacksonville or is just it's not even possible it is possible but right now we're not ready for mls team mls team requires huge attendance like they have their quotas you have to have this many people attending this and that i think but if we are ready for a usl team Okay. I think we are we can support a USL team. Soccer is grown in the city. Uh, if they do it right, we can definitely support a USL team. We can definitely get six thousand people in the stadium. We yeah. might, we won't get forty, but we can get six. And as the time passes, we can build on it. And maybe in ten, fifteen, twenty years, we can change that to an MLS team. But right now, we can certainly support a professional team in the city. I definitely I think winning is definitely important to get them out there. I mean, 
when you have when you had played for Amato, or at least when Amato was going on, did you go to any of their games when you weren't playing at all? And yeah. like, was there a good attendance? Attendance was good at UNF. They had good attendance. Winning is important. I think winning in every organization is important. But the bigger pick, as a, if you want to establish a business that is going to stay long term, mm-hmm. winning shouldn't be the most important criteria. I think establishing a culture building a community being having a good outreach program to community I'll, that's why i think armada signed three local guys but those three guys never played they burned through so much money and they lost a lot of games local guys could have done that easily Easy. like you know we lose instead of you losing with the guys that you're paying hundred fifty thousand dollars a year just with hundred fifty thousand dollars a year you can sign you could have signed 10 local guys, yeah. maybe seven, six local guys, where they could have survived because they live in the house with the parents and stuff, and they get that money. Yeah. You didn't have to provide them room and board. But I'm saying Armada, with the amount of money they spent, they could have created an amazing foundation in Jacksonville using local guys and using people, like that focusing people and winning. Mm-hmm. It's almost like top down approach yeah but from the bo- you know grassroots approach would be using the local guys getting the local college kids bringing a couple of guys professionally paying them big checks but not a lot two three yeah, guys yeah. You need like maybe one defender one midfielder yeah so they can be the guys who local guys look up to you can build a massive force you know i believe we all have two legs we all have, uh, you the know, 11 guys hours. versus 11 guys. <laughs> hey, whoever has the biggest heart and works the hardest, even you might not win, but you want, you can win hearts, you know, and that's what you do as a local team. You win hearts. Now, after Armada, you know, you did mention in the documentary you did with Jack that there was those dark times after Armada. I don't know if you want to get too deep into it, but during those times, you know, did you have your next plan set up? How was that experience for you? And how would you how did you get yourself out of that that hole to make yourself feel happy with the sport? You know, I think we we become like we all going to go through dark patches. Right. And we can we we have to learn from those dark patches and try to come out of it better then you know the first one is the hardest one like the first dark patch was in high school when i couldn't go to college yeah very dark very devastating for me after that was railhawks i remember once i didn't get a contract from railhawks and i'm back that was dark dark moment as well but our model the most the last one was the darkest because I had no hope anymore. Even though I'm looking back, I made a mistake. Probably I could have, should have tried to go play a few more years. But what got me staying was the job that I had. I had a full-time job managing a fitness center. If I didn't have that, I would have gone to different cities and pursued playing. And mm-hmm. I could have played. Yeah, I was good at it because, you know, I got to give a lot of credit to that uh, to the coach, Hoes guy. We did these things. Uh, that improved my game drastically. At the age 30, 30, 31, I, I'm telling you that that was the year that I learned how to genuinely play soccer. And then after that, one, once I started coaching and it added up, I could have gone and played soccer, but like my job locked me down and I didn't go. But I remember once I didn't have that contract, that dark moment that you're talking about, it was a month probably. There were a few days I just didn't leave the house. I just stayed home, binge watched some Netflix some movies, just thinking, walking in the house, not being able to fall asleep, thinking about what am I gonna do? You know, I'm 31 years old. You know, I wanted to play. This is the dream that I was born to live because I long, as long as I remember I had this dream. It was difficult, you know, for a few weeks, a month, it went by and then I had to I talk to myself. I was like, I gotta come out of this and to start something. And I was like, I wanna coach. And I coached already. I was like, I'm going to start coaching and just play locally and see what happens. And uh, that was it. I stopped playing and I started coaching. I stopped playing pursuing professional. Still, still it's hard to think about that day that I had to stop playing soccer and stop pursuing what I love. Imagine, but you, you made know, the same decision to 
go coach and then you did you went to apply to every single club in the city or did you just no i knew i want to work for jfc oh okay you know you know i was already working for jfc oh at that point yeah i i like before the armada i wanted to work for jfc i wanted to coach and i knew i already had a taste of what coaching does but i haven't mentally accepted that i wanted to stop playing where did that come from that that taste of coaching Oh, because uh, once I once I came back to Jacksonville when I yeah. was working at the gym before Armada came, uh-huh. I, was, I started coaching youth. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, so I was coaching. I, I had my U seven teams. Yeah, U eight teams, the seven yeah. year old kids. Right. The funny thing is that same team that I was coaching when I was U, they were U eight. This past season, I coached three of them in the same like U sixteen. Mm-hmm. So U eight, U sixteen. How many years is that? So close to nine, eight nine years, ten years. years yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's it was crazy. It was, tough. It was definitely a, a tough experience for sure, but it was for the better, right? Because now, now that I see it, I mean, you're coaching, you're camp, you're doing camps, all this stuff. You're changing so much for the youth here in absolutely. In Jacksonville. I love that. I wouldn't say it was for better, because uh, I could have played. Like I'm 37 right now, and I still can play physically. So I could have played another six years of pro professional soccer. Yeah. And I just, you know, but I maybe it was for a good because what if I played and I didn't pursue coaching, I didn't coach, I didn't follow with my licensing and stuff, I wouldn't be the coach I am today. Yeah. And I think having, carrying that pain, like that you realize what it is. Yeah. As a coach, you understand what players go through. Yeah. Like I, I always said it. I, it's a part of my resume. I want to be the coach that I didn't have, and that coach could have been the coach when I was seven years old. Helped me learn the skills. That coach could have been the uh, coach that I uh, helped me go to college. Mm-hmm. That coach could have been the guy who co- coached that like, helped me during the pro years. You know, I want to use all my experience of those dark moments to let help people to ease those dark moments. You can't erase it. It's going to be there. But I help my players through those dark times yeah. and through those moments of learning soccer. Yep. Th- those experiences are extremely tough. But yeah. at least it came full circle for you. Now, I want to close out saying something about, you know, football has been around with you in your whole life. What motivated you to keep pushing every single day to get to where you're at today? There had to be something that just... Because you were very consistent from from what we've talked about. You've just been consistent in keeping this dream alive. Yeah. And not a lot of people have that. People are just like, all right, let me just now go have fun with my friends, go party, all this stuff. But what you had was consistency and you were just pushing yourself every single day. But what was that motivation to be where you're at today, even through trying to get that professional contract, or coaching and making your team win for them and to create memories for themselves. What motivated you to be where you're at today? Hmm. I think the main ingredient was love. I absolutely love the game. Mm-hmm. I mean, I play, I watch, I coach, I played in PlayStation. <laughs> I adore and love the game. Yeah, everybody loves the game. Mm-hmm. You know, th- you know. There's a lot of people that claim they love the game, and they do love the game. Mm-hmm. It's just like I am obsessed with the game. I, I am obsessed with every aspect of the game, mm-hmm. and uh, and I'm a very competitive guy. Like right now, you and I, we can go play anything. I would hate to lose. I would want to win. Uh, I play against kids. During this last week's camp, we had a coaches versus coaches. We were 4v4 and we were losing. And I was furious because my teammates were... And we won. Like, And I had to work hard and tackle. That's not common. You don't see a 37-year-old guy who runs a camp to get into it so bad. That's yeah. the difference with me. I am a very competitive guy. I compete. A very aggressive competitive guy, too. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I just don't want... And that's transfer to my coaching. Yeah. I, I'm a very graceful loser. I would never throw my hand... No matter how bad you beat me, even if you commit falls, I don't. Know, in the men's league, I had games that during the game they elbow me. Mm-hmm. I go at the end of the game, shake same guy's hand, and I walk out very respectfully. But I compete, and that's what thing drives me. I can lose to a team as a coach, 
But during that 90 minutes, I want to give absolute best. I want my team to win. Yeah. We win, we win. We lose, we lose. But we give our best and then you walk out. I think that competitive nature of me and love for the game, the combination has become this drive to always be part of the game and want to succeed. I want to thank Ramak Safi for being on the show today. It really means a lot, especially being on our very first show. But I also want to thank you to our listeners for making it this far. And I hope that you can tune in next week for our next show. I promise you don't want to miss it. Until then, I am your host, Ricky Canales, and this is World Class Radio.